to see what Chuck Norris has been up to. Uh, I, I found out that Chuck Norris can kill two stones with one bird. When, when Chuck Norris learned CPR, he brought the dummy back to life. Wow, what a man. Chuck Norris went skydiving. His parachute failed to open, so he took it back the next day for a refund. <laughs> uh, Chuck Norris grew a beard at the age of 18 seconds. Um, and when Chuck Norris does division, there are no remainders. So there you go. That's what Chuck Norris is doing some good math for. Some of you are like, what is this moron talking about Chuck Norris at church for? But just a fun little bit. And there's a lot more that he's been up to. I mean, I can't go over all of them tonight. We'll save some. Uh, but tonight, really, what I want to talk about, and just so you know, uh, since we do have Fields of Faith going on and we got some parents here, we're going, we're going to be mindful of that tonight, probably get out a little earlier than normal. Uh, but that just depends on, you know, it's not just depending on how long-winded I am. It depends on how you're hearing and receiving, right? It's not just up to me. It's up to you. So if you look like, yeah, and you say stuff, then, you know, that, that'll, help us, that'll help us get there. Uh, but you know what? I don't think that'll be a problem. We got a good crew tonight, and like I said, I really sense that that uh, we're going to get something from the Lord tonight, all of us, for sure. And so uh, what's funny is last Wednesday, uh, when Mona taught, there was one thing that she taught or she mentioned kind of in passing, and I knew, I've known for about a week or two that I was going to be teaching tonight, and um, that, that was what the Lord dropped in my heart to share. And lo and behold, and you hear this a lot, and I, I, I understand, I, I mean, I get the Lord just does things that way, but this is really what Pastor Evan absolutely hammered home Sunday uh, when I already had this lined up. But you know what? I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it anyway. I mean, if some is good, more is better, right? Um, especially when it comes to the Word of God. And so this is what we're going to talk about tonight. The title of tonight's message is called Caretaker. Caretaker. And, you know, you need to think about that word like two or actually two different words. Sometimes we, we think about that as a compound word. Uh, in our everyday vernacular, you hear of someone who's a caretaker, and you're like, well, this is just someone who takes care of uh, somebody for whatever. They've got needs of some kind. And a lot of times when we use a word so much like that, it loses its meaning a little bit. But think about this as two words, caretaker. This is who God is to us. He is our caretaker. He's to take our cares from us, but we got to give them to him, right? And so we are going to talk a little bit more about that and build uh, more on top of what Pastor Evan was talking about and, and go back to it. But uh, first, I want to lay a little foundation and talk about our thoughts. So our thought life is really important when it comes to cares, right? Because the cares, the worries, the anxieties, the things that we develop in our thought life, those are the things that lead to the cares that we have, right? Th this is true. And I'm going to pull this up here. Oh, I wish that was an object lesson and that was planned, but it wasn't. It's only water. That's right. Unless Chad spiked it with something. They've done that before on me. Um, it'll dry. So our thoughts are important. And I want to open up here in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you're taking notes, then you want to write down 2 Corinthians 10. And if you're not, you're going to want to take notes, all right? 2 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read this from the NIV and the Passion. I'm going to read uh, chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. NIV first, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. How many of you have heard this before, right? We're to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So let's read it in the Passion Translation now. It says, although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons... So we're hearing the word weapons a lot, aren't we? Weapons. They're energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Oh, come on. So this is what we'll, uh, spoiler alert, this is what we're going to close with and end with tonight. 
We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Since we're armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. Man, this is like, it's like I wish they made this into a movie right now with, with these words. So, but what we find here and what you find in many other scriptures in God's word is that we are the gatekeepers of our thoughts, right? So I'm the gatekeeper of the thoughts that I think of, the thoughts that I allow in and the thoughts that I allow to stay there and to cook. Now, any, any thought can approach my gate, so to speak, any thought. I can't control what thoughts may come. In fact, this is where the enemy likes to get after people and he likes to send thoughts, send thoughts, send thoughts. The Bible talks about how there's fiery darts, right? Fiery darts from the enemy and he's sending these thoughts. But I, I have... I have the option, I have the decision, I have the choice on what to do with the thoughts that he sends. It's up to me, right? Um, I've heard it said this way, I think Brother Hagin said this, I I can't control birds that are flying over my head, but I can control if they build a nest on top of my head, right? right? So thoughts are going to come, and so we can't get down, we can't get dejected, we can't think that we're no good for having a thought like that come. But what we can control is if we choose to think on that thought and let it cook, so to speak, in the oven of our mind, right? So some thoughts may sneak by when we're not being vigilant. You know, I've had this happen before when I'm tired. Come on, when when I'm idle. When I haven't been nourishing myself with God's word, it's so much easier for thoughts to sneak by and for them to start forming in your mind. People that, uh, we've all done this before, when you sin, when you trip up, when you mess up, typically it's not something that you just on a whim decided to do. What's happened is you've allowed a certain thought pattern to develop, and now you're at the point where your defenses are down and you just act on what you've been thinking on. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so we don't just typically just trip, oh, I just fell into sin. Well, it, you didn't just fall into it. There's, there's something that's been going on. There's a, there's a thought pattern that we've allowed to take place, right? Uh, and so we are the gatekeepers. And so I must do something with the thoughts that come to me. I must. And the good news is, for you and for me, you have the ability to do something with them, all right? You do have the ability to do something with them. So I mentioned that there's a, there was a lot of mention of weapons, the weapons that we fight with. And I've always read this in, in 2 Corinthians 10 here. And, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with this verse. But they, he never really um, infers or points to specifically what weapons we're talking about. And so I, w- I was just thinking today, I'm like, well, wh- where does it talk about weapons in the Word? And I, I thought to Ephesians 6 when it talks about the armor of God. And so a weapon, uh, in most cases, is something that you use to go on the offensive with, right? You're, there, you're a weapon. You have a weapon. It's an offensive tool. Uh, and so when you look at Ephesians 6 and it talks about the armor of God, you can get to verse 17, and we have this scripture, Ephesians 6, 17, and at the end of it it says, And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God... This is the offensive weapon that we have. This is the weapon that we're talking about. The sword of the Spirit, which is, it's what? It's the Word of God. And it's not just the Word of God. It is the spoken Word of God out of your mouth. That's the sword of the Spirit, right? It's the sword of the Spirit. I believe there's a place in Revelation when it's talking about Jesus coming back and, and his, the, there's a sword coming out of his mouth. It's the sword. It's his Word. So it's his Word coming out of our mouth that is the weapon that we have. And what we're talking about in this scripture above is the, this is the weapon that we have and the weapon that we must employ to control and, and to determine what thoughts we think. Okay? And so a lot of people, what, what they'll do is like when a thought comes, they're like, oh, just I'm not going to think about that. Does that ever work? Oh, I'm just, I'm not going to think. Of, okay, just don't think about that. You can't change thoughts with thoughts. The only way that you can interrupt a thought pattern or change a thought pattern is to use words. This is the only way. Thoughts respond to words. It's, it's been that way. It'll always be that way. Um, you know, I've, there was this example in youth a long time ago, and, and I've seen it once or twice since. I don't remember it fully. But it's basically if you're trying to, to, to count to 10 in your head, 
and say another number, I don't know. The, the, the idea is that you can't think something at one time and say something different at another time. Your thought, your words will always interrupt what you think, always. And so if there, there is a thought, a prevalent thought that keeps coming to us, that keeps coming to us, we need to find out what God's word says about what that thought is, and we need to put it in our mouth and declare it out of our mouth. This is how, this is how we take a thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I have to know what Christ says about that thought that, I, that just came. I have to. And so our words are the weapon that we're to use for that. Um, let's turn to James chapter 4. So my thought life is dependent on the words I'm speaking or not speaking. The words I'm speaking or not speaking, that's what my thought life is is going to be dependent on. James chapter four, verses six through seven. It says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We heard a little bit about grace on Sunday. What's grace again? Grace is God's power. It's God's supply. It's heaven's flow. You know, gra grace is Jesus. Grace is Jesus. Jesus is heaven's flow. Jesus was God's supply. Jesus is God's power made manifest. That's grace. And so, and so grace is God's power made available to us. And so it says, God resists the proud, but he give, who does he give grace to? Who does he allow heaven's flow, his power to go to? The humble. So, so this is really important here, and this ties in, and I, how these scriptures came together is really cool because I didn't, I didn't plan it like that, but, but it's, this is God's word, and it ties together, and it doesn't contradict itself. It builds on itself, and it's amazing. So, so who gets more grace? The humble do. And so we see here it says, submit to God. How many of you know it's important to submit to God? Okay, well, how do I submit to God? Do I just say, God, I'm submitted to you? I mean, that, that's a great start. Say, Lord, I'm submitted to you. And the word Lord here becomes important too because if he's the Lord of our life, that means that he has the say in our life. And so whoever we're submitted to is the one that we're allowing to speak into our life and to direct our life. And so it's more than just me saying, God, I'm submitted to you. If I'm submitted to God, here it is, I'm submitted to his word, right? God and his word are one. Jesus is the word. Come on, y'all talk back to me. Jesus is the word. He and his word are one. So if I'm submitted to God, I can't just say, God, I'm submitted to you. If I'm submitted to him, my life will look like it because I'm submitted to what his word says. All of it. Not just the part that's relevant in 2024 to what we think. All of it. I'm submitted to all of it all the time. Okay? And so this is how we are submitted to God. We are submitted to his word. Um, so when I humble myself and submit to God's words, this says that I can resist the devil when he comes with thoughts, when he comes with junk, I can resist them and he will flee. How do, well, how, how do I know that he'll flee? The same way that you know that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells, how do I know the devil will flee? Well, the Bible tells you he will. If you submit yourselves to God, to his word, you resist the devil, and he will flee from you because the Bible tells you so. We need to bring back all the kids' songs. I'm telling you what. Our kids' prayers and kids' songs, they're powerful stuff. They're powerful stuff because the Bible tells me so. Why, why do you think that? Why do you believe that? Because the Bible tells me so. That, if that's not a good enough reason for someone, then don't worry about that being a good enough reason for them. I believe this because I believe the Bible. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's talk a little bit about care casting. We're going to go over to 1 Peter chapter 5 uh, and read verses 5 through 9. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 9. Likewise, you younger people, you young folk, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Didn't we not just read this? We just read this in James. So James, or I guess more correctly, his name was Jacob, is the half-brother of Jesus. 
And you know what's interesting, I was just doing some of this reading today. This isn't the James the Apostle, James the Disciple. This is, this is James, we'll call him James, uh, but his name was Jacob. We'll call him James for this sake. But this wasn't James, Jesus' disciple. This was his half-brother. And if you remember, if you can look, you can look through the scriptures, I'm, it, it's pretty clear, it seems pretty clear that he wasn't even a believer in what Jesus was doing until after the resurrection. Uh, because, you know, Jesus goes to his own, own hometown. You remember this thing? And there are other examples where they were, he was with his brothers and everything, and they, they just weren't buying into his ministry and what he was about. Um, but James, Jesus' half-brother here, ends up becoming one of the, after Jesus' resurrection, becomes a believer and is one of the big church leaders in Jerusalem. And so he writes this, and then we see Peter. We know Peter, uh, the apostle Peter, and he was Jesus' disciple. He's saying the same thing. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Uh, Check this out. Comma, comma. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And so what I'm seeing here is because there's a comma here, there's an inference that the way that I humble myself before God is by casting my care on him. Is that right? I'm not an English major, but I I think that that's what we're talking about. We're talking about one sentence here. Again, it's divided by a verse, but that doesn't matter in the context of what we're reading. When I humble myself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt me in due time, I do that by casting all my care upon him for he cares for me. So if I don't humble myself and cast my care on the Lord, whatever it is that's been weighing me down, what I'm doing is I won't be able to get the grace there that's to help me, his flow, his power, and his supply that I need right now. And we can also infer from this passage if... Me casting my care is how I humble myself before him. Me not casting my care is a form of pride. And we know this, and we've talked about this, but what, what is care? Care is, I've got this, I'll figure it out, I'll find a way. And you know when you've been walking under the weight of care for a little bit, uh, you show it physically, you show it mentally, You show it spiritually, you show it in every way because it's weighty, because it's on you. So someone who casts their cares, they're lighter in all of those areas. And it's something that you can see. You know, I've had this, you see these, you have these conversations with your spouse or with a loved one, and you can be like, what's, what is wrong with you? Nothing. Okay. I'm like, we're still having these. I'm like, I've been married to you for 20 years. I, I tell my, I'm like, do I look like a moron to you? <laughs> so can we just skip all of this nothing stuff and let's just, ha- let's tell me, tell me what it is. Um, but you can tell when someone has care on them, right? We're losing sleep. We're zoning out. We're missing time with our family because it's all on us. It's up to us. It's dependent on us that we find a way out of whatever it is that we're under the weight of. Um, here, here's some good news. And again, you know, sometimes, and this is a good thing when you hear the word and you're hearing it again and you're like, duh, well, it's good that it's duh, but we need to hear it again because you can't hear enough truth. And sometimes if, if it's duh to us, but we're not doing it, then we're deceiving ourselves. Let me tell you something. God cares more about your kids than you do. God cares more about your parents, your grandkids, your siblings. He cares more about them than you do. And so sometimes we, we assume the role of caretaker in the people. In, and I understand where I'm coming from. We are to care for people in that way. But if our care stops there and it's limited to us, we're running out quick and we're doing no one any good. Our care then has to be cast on him. On him. Y'all with me? So, um, let's look at, where do we, we stop at? Ver, we're, verse 7, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So I I love, like, this is all, again, in the context of one little passage here where he's talking about casting your care on God because he cares for you. And he's saying, here's why. Because the enemy, your enemy is like a roaring lion. He's, he's like that. that he's, just, he's looking for easy prey. Someone who's slow. I watched a, a few weeks ago before one of the Hogs games. I was just upstairs going to watch it by myself. And I'm, I record all the Hogs games. And I'm good. I can put my phone away. And I don't have to like watch it right, right then. Because I, I still have to watch every play. I've got to rewind it. I've got to see certain things. I've got to hear it. So don't text me during a Hogs game. Like, you, you won't hear from me till the next day. My phone goes bye-bye, and uh, I, I rarely watch a Hogs game live. And this time it was usually I'm busy. We've got stuff going on, uh, whatever. This time it was because whatever was coming on before the Hogs game was some type of thing going on in Africa where there were some lions, and, and I couldn't take my eyes off of it. I'm like, this is amazing. And we've got cats, and our cats just, like, somehow came upstairs, and they were just mesmerized by, like, the big cats on the screen. I, got, I took a picture of them. Like, they're just watching them. Like, are these, you know, are these cats in the room with us right now? I can't tell. Um, but you look at how lions act and what they were, you know, if you heard this, like, they're looking for someone who's kind of a little outside of the pack, someone who's maybe a little hurt, Right? And so when we're walking around with care and weighted down and it makes us slow, we become easy prey for the enemy. And so he's saying, be sober, be vigilant. This is what the enemy is about. And so it's very important that we keep our care casted on God for that reason right there. Um, So let's go over to Philippians chapter 4. So I love what, uh, and this is something Pastor Evan's done for as long as I can remember, and it's a really good visual, and we did it again on Sunday. But, you know, when you talk about casting your care, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast it on the Lord. I'm going to throw it. I'm going to give it to him. I'm going to get rid of it. Um, and that's something that we did on Sunday. And so we've done this before. You've, you've done this before. Maybe you did it on Sunday, and you cast your care on the Lord. How many of you, if you've cast your care on the Lord on Sunday, that care tried to creep back in on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, Right? And so it's not just a one-time thing when we do it. Here's the deal. It needs to get to where it is a one-time thing for us. And so I want to talk about that here in a moment. But when we cast our care, it's not just like, wow, I just threw that through a portal and I'll never see it again. A lot of times that care, and it's because we allow it to, right? But again, we have a choice and we have the ability to keep that care cast it. So let's, I, I want to talk about how, how do we keep it there? So in Philippians chapter four, verse six through seven, uh, the apostle Paul writes and says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Boy, this is, these are some good instructions right here. This is very plain. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then somebody say then. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Are you interested in that? I love this, and in some translations, it it talks about how it's bypassing your understanding. God's peace can bypass your understanding. And this is something that I pray for, for people who who they may have someone who who went home to be with the Lord, and they're, they're grieving. Um, A lot of times, some of those people, you'll be like, man, or maybe they're not grieving or it doesn't look like it to you. And a lot of times, the reason that might be is because because God's peace is resting on them and it's bypassed their understanding. And so our understanding doesn't understand how they can be like that, but it's because God's peace is in play. Okay, so God's peace, it it doesn't mesh with our understanding. It can bypass it. Uh, according to Philippians chapter 4 here, it says, His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Um, and so this is so powerful. This is so, so powerful. Uh, sometimes we neglect God's word because it sounds too simple. And we think our complex cares and worries require a more complex answer or process. Come on, hang with me for a minute. This is amazing because this is, did we not just read it? Hey, go back to verse uh, six, please. Don't worry about anything. 
Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Does that sound pretty simple to you? Yes. Sounds pretty simple. And so the reason that we don't like this sometimes is because we've been undergoing and walking and living under the weight of a care for a long time. And so it's like this conversation. I'll go back to the conversation you could have with a spouse or something. And you finally get it out of them. What's wrong? And they tell you for like 12 minutes, like, what, what's going on and what, what they've been under the, under the care of. And then you're like, well, we should probably just cast that on God, don't you think? How many of you have done that before? Then you get like a sigh. You're like, I know. Come on, you're following me, right? And the reason that we do this is because I just explained to you in 12 minutes what I've been carrying for the last three weeks. And the answer that you're giving me is just that. That's all you have for what I just laid out and what I've been under? Oh, come on. So we're bypassing the simplicity and the powerful uh, effects that God's word can have in our lives because it's not matching what we believe is so complex and hard in our own life. Oh, this is good. This is good. You see, that step of faith seems too simple to handle our big care. Our big care. We don't like when the care we've been carrying for so long, it's so big to us, can be so called taken care of by just casting it on God. Oh, we're going to get into more of this in a minute. But to get God's results, I need to appropriate God's ways. To, to get to the then part and his peace path, I need to do these things right here. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for what he's done. Then you will experience this type of peace. And so you can see how we appropriate God's, God's uh, ways here. And what's really cool here is that in verse 7, it says, His peace exceeds anything that we can understand. Listen what it will do. It will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. So even though I'm the gatekeeper of my mind, if I have God's peace Guarding my mind, I'm not even the only one having to guard my mind. God's peace is at play, and it's guarding my mind now. How many of you, and, and this word peace here, uh, you've heard it maybe said before that it's like an umpire. An umpire is somebody who calls the shots out, safe, ball, strike. The peace of God is to act like that in our hearts and in our minds. So when a thought comes, the peace of God is what's to say, that's okay to stay. Nope, that one's not. Get it out. That one's good. That one's not. Get it out. Okay? This is what the peace of God does when it's in play, when we've employed verse 6 and we're living in verse 7. Okay. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 through 16. It says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Man, Jesus faced all the, all the same things we did, but he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and will find grace to help us when we need it most. And so if you're familiar with this scripture, I love it because it can kind of paints the picture of going into the throne room of God, which you can enter the throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because of the blood of Jesus, I can come boldly and freely to the throne of God. Man. So I get access to the throne room of God. And there, I come there to receive mercy. How many of you need mercy? Man, I need mercy in my life and to get grace in my time of need. So for whatever I'm going through right now, there's a heaven supply for me at that time. So I can come right into the throne room because of the blood of Jesus. And here's the deal. If I want to get mercy and receive grace and I want to leave with God's grace, guess what I can't be leaving with? I can't be leaving with my care. When I come there, I'm to leave my care with him, and I'm going to walk away with his grace. I'm to walk away with his word. You know, uh, Pastor Evan talked about, especially this word cast, typically you think about casting a line, fishing, right? So it's like if we're going to cast that care on God, God's going to take whatever we put on the hook there, and he's going to put his word uh, on it instead of a fish, and we're going to reel that word back in, and we're going to take that. So he took, he took what we casted. He gave us something better. 
And so now what's to occupy my thoughts instead of that care is the word that he's given me. And so this is why you need to get in your Bible and you need to find out what God's word says about the thoughts, about the cares that are weighing on you and tormenting you. I'm telling you what, there's something in God's word for it. There is something in God's word for it. And so you need to take that and you need to replace those thoughts of that care that you have with that word right there, with that word. So cast it and keep it casted. I saw this, uh, I saw this, um, I don't know what it was on, but it was a picture of someone, you know how like when you cast your care on God and I was going to do it, but you got that picture, Brad, I sent it to him. This is what it's like right here. Me trying to monitor the thing I left in God's hands and you just peek around the corner. Hey God, how, how's it going on that? Right? We doing okay on that thing? I'm ch- just checking up. How many of you doing this all the time? Like we casted that care on Sunday on a Monday. We're like, Hey God, we do, how we doing? Right? Just checking back up. Well, we need to take whatever word God gave us and we need to get it coming out of our mouth right there and let God handle that part. Let God handle that. Because when I, when I cast the, my, my line in with the bait on it, I don't cast it and then just dive in and go after it again. Right? This is what we're doing when we cast our cares on God. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Hold on. I need to take that and I need to think about it a little bit more. I may have something for that. Oh, I've got something now that's going to be better than what God has for it. Let's be honest with ourselves. And this is where pride creeps back in. And this is where Christians talk. I'm not in pride. I'm not in pride. Are you carrying cares around? So just a good time to be honest with ourselves. Am I carrying cares around? My wife and I check each other on this right here. Like, I, I don't have the right to walk around with cares. With what God has done in my life, and if I look back properly and I thank him for all he has done, I don't have the right to walk around with cares. He's taken care of all of my cares before, so for me to walk around with cares, it's not okay. It's not okay. So just a good way for us to think about that. We need to give God an opportunity to do what he said he would do because he cares for us. Amen. So, I love, it's interesting in 1 Peter 5 uh, that we read a minute ago and in Hebrews here, how um, it talks about how Jesus, Jesus underwent the same things that we're going through, Jesus went through. And the same things that we're going through, other believers are going through is what it said in uh, James, or 1 Peter, sorry, in 1 Peter. So one of the problems is that many people, and we've probably all done this before, they think that their situation is unique to them, right? Like, no, no, one, no one understands what I'm, what I'm going through. How many of you have done this before? I know, I, know that, I know that they've been through that a little bit, but not like this. Because this is me. And since it's me, it's unique, it's different, and... If we're being honest with ourselves, we've, we've all done this. We've all done this. It's too complicated. It's too messed up. And the, the truth is that this type of thinking keeps us from coming to God as we should and giving our care to him and letting him care for us like a father. I mean, it's like when, if my girls were going through something, you know, they're 11 and 13. If they're going through something, and again, you can see them walking around with care and something's bothering them, and typically they're good about telling you. But if they're walking around with something and letting something bother them for a week, and they didn't tell dad in the first place, the chances are dad has the answer for what they need right then. Why? Well, I think about it. Dad's been there. He's been a 13-year-old before. He's hopefully a little more spiritually mature, right? He may, he's, he's been there. He's seen some things. He's got resources that they don't have. And so th- it's the same way with God. And so we're going around carrying this, and he's like, I've got, I've got something for that. What are you doing? Don't, don't do that. Don't live like that. I have something for you. And what, what keeps us from doing that is like, well, God, this is different. You, I mean, this, look at the web of all this stuff. And I know uh, it says that, that Jesus went through these same things. How did Jesus go through this? He did without sin. And there's other people in the world going through it now. And And if we're all honest with ourselves, there's other people in the world going through it a lot worse than we could ever even imagine. 
And so uh, Pastor Bill Johnson said it this way, we need to pay attention to how we identify a problem. It's just so big, no one knows, no one understands, because sometimes we would rather have sympathy from a friend than breakthrough from a person of faith. Oh, this is good preaching. This is good preaching, because, because we do this far too often, and we just continue on in our cares, because that's our mindset, and that's how we think. And I can't be in faith if I'm in care. I cannot be in faith if I'm in care. As long as I have care, I'm separating myself from God's assistance. I'm separating myself from God's grace because I'm in pride. And grace only comes to the humble, to those who are submitted to God. We must become proficient at identifying care and worry in our life and deal with them accordingly. Let me say this again. We have to become what are you you're talking about? I got to come proficient, like I'm proficient at Microsoft Excel. Yeah, you've got to become good at casting your care on God. This isn't, this isn't something that nobody can attain or that only some people can do. It's a spiritual discipline, just like reading your Bible and praying is. And we need to be trained in doing this. All right, Mark chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. Yeah, we're going to read it from the NLT and then the New King James. Uh, Mark 4, 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those, or represents uh, others who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out. God's word is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth and the desire for other things. So no fruit is produced. In the New King James, it says, these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. They hear God's word and the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in. They choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And I always found this amazing in Mark chapter 4 when it's talking about the parable of the sower because this is the third type of, of person that they're going through. They go through a person where the, the seed's kind of scattered along the path. They hear it, but it doesn't really get in them, and the enemy just comes and takes it, right? And then there's a second one where they hear the word, they hear the word, but the, they don't endure with the word, and it gets scorched, and it doesn't produce anything. And I'm like, well, nothing really happened there. But, it, but in this third example, uh, it, it fell among the thorns, uh, others who hear God's words, but all too quickly, or uh, in the New King James, it says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So the seed of God's word actually got planted here. It got planted here, and there are things that choked the word out, and it became unfruitful. And then it goes on to say, this is the seed that's sown among good soil, and it produces a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And that's what we want in our life. And so you, you might say, I'm here on a Wednesday night. The word is being sown. I'm getting the word. But if we allow cares to choke it out of us, if we allow the desires for other things, the deceitfulness of riches, the lure of wealth. If those things are filling our eyes and we're allowing cares to choke out the word, we're just as good as someone who uh, the seed was sown, they picked it up and Satan came and, and stole it. No fruit was produced there either. And so we don't, sometimes I've, I've been there before. I'm, I've deceived myself because I think I'm in church. I'm hearing the word. I'm hearing the word. I'm getting the word, the word is being sown, the word is being sown. And I'm like, why am I not seeing much fruit produced in my life? Well, could it possibly be because the cares of this world have choked it out? Or my desire for other things? That is good. The number one voice that drowns out the voice or the word of God is care. They choke out the word of God in my life, making it unfruitful. So again, if we want God's word to be working in our lives, we must become proficient at casting our care and our worry. All right, let's read, the, read this last uh, verse here, Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read um, verses 25 through 34, and this is in the Passion Translation. This is why I tell you to never be worried about your life for all that you will need, or for all that you need will be provided, such as food, water, clothing, everything your body needs. Isn't there more to your life than a meal? Isn't your body more than clothing? Consider the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? 
They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly Father provides them with each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your Father than they? So, which one of you, by worrying, could add anything to your life? And so, let's just stop here and obviously make, make this point that uh, having care and worrying, these are the same things. When you have a care about something, you're worried about it, Okay. Uh, or these are, uh, they're similar, if, if not the exact same. So, which one of us, by worrying, could add anything to our life? And why would you worry about your clothing? Look at all the beautiful flowers of the field. They don't work or toil, and, and yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was robed in beauty like one of these. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you the clothes you need, you of little faith? So then, forsake your worries. There's a good word to us tonight. You need to forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly Father already know the things your bodies require? So above all, constantly seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Verse 34, refuse to worry about tomorrow. So here's some good homework for you on, okay, I want to learn how to be proficient at casting my care on, on the Lord. So you know some of the steps to do that. We read it in Philippians. We read it in First Peter. You cast your care. We're going to come to God. We're not going to worry about anything. We're going to pray about it. We're going to thank God for what he has done. And, and here's, here's a way that you can see if you're making progress. Today, I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. Okay? So you can see if you're making progress by, am I worried about... Do I have a care about? Am I worried about something in the future and and anything past, I don't know, tonight? This is a good question for us to ask. If I am, I'm instructed here to, uh, to not worry about tomorrow. You know, these are red letters too. This is Jesus talking. They're white on the screen, but they're red in your Bible if it, if it has red letters. Refuse to worry about tomorrow. Don't worry. Somebody say, don't worry. But deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You know, that's really what happens with worry. You worry, 95% of the things you worry about don't end up happening. And they take care of themselves. And so it, it eats at us. It steals from us. Worry, fear, cares, they steal from us in every way. Um... But we need to not worry. Someone say it again. Don't worry. worry. I walked by, I picked up uh, my kid from uh, kids class on Sunday, and they were dancing to a song, you know, the don't worry. Be thankful. Not be happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. (laughs) Don't worry. Be thankful. Be thankful. I'm telling you what right there. If you follow those instructions tonight, and instead of worry, you choose to be thankful, it's all going to change. It will all change. It'll change for you. I'm telling you. And think about, think about if that was your way of life. Think about if that was a discipline that you had instilled in your life. Man, how many of you can, can imagine, how many of you can picture a life without worry, a life free from cares? Oh, it's amazing. And the reason that many people aren't raising their hands or can't picture it is because it seems so far-fetched. But it's not. It's not. It's attainable. God's word gives us that. Uh, So, here, just a little more uh, bold statement. Worry is darkness. Worry is a sin. We are commanded not to worry. It's a sin. Jesus told us not to do it. That seems like, that seems good enough for me. Don't worry. So, we are equipped to resist fear and worry and to cast our cares on God. So we have to train ourselves in this spiritual discipline. Like I said, just like praying, just like reading our Bible, we must employ it in our lives, and it will only become a discipline once we've trained in it enough. And so this, these are just good tools from God's Word to live the victorious life that he's called us to live. And your life will not look victorious if you're, if you're weighed down with worry and with care. It will not look like that. And so we, we're supposed to be projecting Jesus to the world. Jesus didn't walk around worried and full of care. He, he had a close, intimate relationship with his father 
where he spent time with and he kept, did, did, did Jesus have an opportunity to care or worried? The, he was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. It, is, what do you think that may be producing right there? But he gave it to the Lord. And guess what? He endured all the same things we did, yet without sin. Without sin. We, we can employ these things in our life. It is a discipline that we can train ourselves in. Um, I want to go back to 2 Corinthians 10.5. The second part of that, as we close, says we capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. We capture, like prisoners of war, every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. So when that care that you've casted pops back up in your thought life, I'm to take it in chains to Jesus where it will bow and be taken care of. This is what this is saying right here. I'm to, I'm to bring it in chains to Jesus, and he will take care of it there. So training our thought life is like, it's like training anyone. It's like training your kid. It's like training your dog. We repeat steps over and over and over until the steps don't need to be repeated any longer. I tell my kid, go brush your teeth. I'm st- I, 11 years old. I've told you this for as many, long as you've had teeth. Go brush your teeth. You know, you're supposed to go in there, and for the first few years they're doing this, watch, you're supposed to do it for them, right? Then you're supposed to watch them do it, right? Or I'm probably missing a step, but you get the idea of what training looks like. But they're supposed to do it. And come to find out, if you stop training and you just say, hey, did you brush your teeth? They could say, yeah. And you come to find out, when you go to give them a kiss, they did not brush their teeth. And so more training has to happen then. And so we can be trained in this just like we train in other ways. We've got to go back to it. We've got to repeat the step. Repeat that step. Repeat that step again. I'm going to cast my care on the Lord. I'm going to give it to him. I'm not going to peek around the corner and see how he's doing with it. I'm going to take his word. I'm going to replace those thoughts. And if those thoughts come, I'm going to be at the gate and I want to be watchful. And here's the deal. Some of you may think, this sounds like just too much. How can I do all of this? If you couldn't do it, God wouldn't tell us that we could do it and give us the things we need to do it. The, what it comes down to for me and what it comes down to for everyone is something that Pastor Nate um, said a while back regarding faith. Am I interested enough in living this type of life? If you're interested enough in living free from care, you will do what it takes to live free from care. Why? Because you have the tools to do it. You've got the tools to do it. And so we can train ourselves in this thing. And I'll tell you what, it's not, it's not just all willpower. If it sounds like that, that's not it at all. Because we are getting, when we come to the throne of God, when we humble ourselves and give him our care, he gives us his grace. His grace. When we do what Philippians chapter 4 says, he gives us his peace that will help guard our hearts and guard our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Did you get anything out of that? Thanks to you, 12. Appreciate that. No, I believe, you know, God's word is so good. It's so good. And it's getting planted in our hearts. And we're not going to let the cares of this life, the, the lure of wealth, and just other things come and choke that word out. It's going to produce a harvest in our lives. In Beyond Church, Beyond Church, we're having harvest pop up in our lives. Guess what? If everybody in here had abundant harvest pop up from the result of God's word being planted in your life, guess who's sharing in those harvests? Those people out there. That's who they're for. There'll be plenty for you be plenty for others in here. There's going to be more left over for people out there. That's what this is about. So I want to do, uh, just to to go back to to Sunday, we we prayed and and we did that there. We're not going to do that again, but but I just want to pray over us that, that we take God's word, we take God's word for what it says, for how he means it, 
and we employ it in our lives, and there is grace to do that. The most amazing thing about all of this, sometimes when it just sounds so overwhelming, oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. No, no, listen, you gotta rely on, there's someone that, the, that Jesus left us when he left the earth, the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls him, my favorite word, the helper. When you need help, the Holy Spirit's there to help you. And, and he'll help us do these things. This is why, this is why, like, you probably experienced the peace of God more than you think. You experience that because when a thought comes, you're like, that was, that was out. Where did that come from? I don't receive that. In fact, here's what I believe. How many of you have done that before? The peace of God is acting as an umpire and it's saying, no, we're, that's, that's not what we're about. We're not going to be doing that. And so a lot of this is happening already and we just have to continue in it, continue in it. And we've got a helper to help us do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being so good to us. Thank you that we can cast our cares on you because you care for us. And as we humble ourselves and we cast our cares, you promise that you would give grace. You give grace to the humble. And so by your spirit, by the help of the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, we thank you that you help us keep whatever care we've casted, keep it on you, cast it on you, and turned over to you. And we purpose to replace it with the word that you've given us, with your grace, your word, your power instead. And we replace that in our thoughts when the thoughts of worry, of whatever that care is, try to pop up. Thank you. Thank you that we're not on our own, but we have a helper to help us along the way. Father, for every person in here, thank you that the helper's present every day, every day. And he reminds us of what you've said to us. So we thank you that we have all that we need to live a carefree life because we know you care so much more for us. So we thank you that the cares that we've casted, the cares that we cast, Lord, we keep them on you. We keep them on you. We live free from them. And as a result, we have your grace to overcome. We have your grace, heaven's flow for all that we need in our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, we love you guys. Uh, man, God's word is so good. Let it do a work in your life. Uh, don't, you don't leave it here. Take it with you. It'll be good to you and do you good. Uh, we love y'all. Why don't you get your kids? If y'all got people at Fields of Faith, I don't know, go see what's going on. Pick them up, and we will see you guys Sunday morning. Be blessed. Thank you for joining us. We hope you were strengthened and encouraged by the Word of God. If you need prayer, feel free to text us at the number on the screen below. You can also send us an email to info at beyondchurch.org or submit a prayer request form on our website at beyondchurch.org. If you'd like to partner with us in preaching Jesus, you can give securely online through our app or website, or if you prefer to mail your gift, send it to the address shown below. Stay connected with us throughout the week. You can download the app for all of our latest messages and announcements, and be sure and follow us on our socials at Beyond Church. If you've never attended in person, we highly encourage you to plan a visit. You'll never regret prioritizing godly community. We love you and hope to see you soon.